Good evening, and welcome to Restored Lore, your home for old, odd, and obscure stories on YouTube. Tonight's story is Carcassonne by Lord Dunsany. This story was first published in 1910 in Dunsany's A Dreamer's Tales. Just a quick note before we begin, unlike many of the proper nouns in a Dunsany story, Carcassonne is a real city in southern France, in Occitania. Arne, however, is not. No. Let's open our imaginations and begin. In a letter from a friend whom I have never seen, one of those that read my books, this line was quoted, but he, he never came to Carcassonne. I do not know the origins of the line, but I made this tale about it. When Camarac reigned at Arne, and the world was fairer, he gave a festival to all the wield to commemorate the splendor of his youth. They say that his house at Arne was huge and high, and its ceiling painted blue, and when evening fell men would climb up by ladders and light the scores of candles hanging from slender chains. And they say, too, that sometimes a cloud would come and pour in through the top of one of the oriel windows, and it would come over the edge of the stonework as the sea mist comes over a sheer cliff's shaven lip where an old wind has blown forever and forever. He has swept away thousands of leaves and thousands of centuries. They are all one to him. He owes no allegiance to time. And the cloud would reshape itself in the hall's lofty vault and drift on through it slowly and out to the sky again through another window. And from its shape, the knights in Camarac's hall would prophesy the battles and sieges of the next season of war. They say of the hall of Camarac at Arne that there hath been none like it in any land, and foretell that there will be never. Hither had come in the folk of the weald, from sheepfold and from forest, revolving slow thoughts of food and shelter and love, and they sat down wondering in that famous hall, and therein also were seated the men of Arne, the town that clustered round the king's high house, and all was roofed with red maternal earth. If old songs may be trusted, it was a marvelous hall. Many who sat there could only have seen it distantly before, a clear shape in the landscape, but smaller than a hill. Now they beheld along the wall the weapons of Camarac's men, of which already the lute players made songs, and tales were told at evening in the byres. There they described the shield of Camarac that had gone to and fro across so many battles, and the sharp but dinted edges of his sword— there were the weapons of Gadriel the Leal, and Norn, and Atheric of the Sleety Sword, and Hariel the Wild, Yerald, and Thanga of Esk. Their arms hung evenly all around the hall, low, where a man could reach them. And in the place of honor in the midst, between the arms of Camarac and of Gadriel the Leal, hung the harp of Arleon. And of all the weapons hanging on those walls, none were more calamitous to Canarac's foes than the harp of Arleon. For to a man that goes up against a strong place on foot, pleasant indeed is the twang and jolt of some fearful engine of war that his fellow warriors are working behind him, from which huge rocks go sighing over his head and plunge among his foes. And pleasant to a warrior in the wavering light are the swift commands of his king, and a joy to him are his comrades' instant cheers exulting suddenly at a turn of the war. All this and more was the harp to Camarac's men. For not only would it cheer his warriors on, but many a time would Arleon of the harp strike wild amazement into opposing hosts by some rapturous prophecy suddenly shouted out while his hand swept over the roaring strings. Moreover, no war was ever declared till Camarac and his men had listened long to the harp and were elate with the music and mad against peace. Once Arleon, for the sake of a rhyme, had made war upon Estabon, and an evil king was overthrown, and honor and glory won. From such queer motives does good sometimes accrue. Above the shields and the harps all round the hall were the painted figures of heroes of fabulous famous songs. Too trivial, because too easily surpassed by Camarac's men, seemed all the victories that the earth had known. 
Neither was any trophy displayed of Camarac's seventy battles, for those were as nothing to his warriors or him, compared with those things that their youth had dreamed, and which they mightily purposed yet to do. Above the painted pictures there was darkness, for evening was closing in, and the candles swinging on their slender chain were not yet lit in the roof. It was as though a piece of the night had been builded into the edifice like a huge natural rock that juts into a house. And there sat all the warriors of Arn, and the wheeled folk wondering at them, and none were more than thirty, and all were skilled in war. And Camarac sat at the head of all, exulting in his youth. We must wrestle with time for some seven decades, and he is a weak and puny antagonist in the first three bouts. Now, there was present at this feast a diviner, one who knew the schemes of fate, and he sat among the people of the Weald and had no place of honor, for Camarac and his men had no fear of fate. And when the meat was eaten and the bones cast aside, the king rose up from his chair, and, having drunken wine, and being in the glory of his youth, and with all his knights about him, called to the diviner, saying, Prophecy! And the diviner rose up, stroking his gray beard, and spake guardedly. There are certain events, he said, upon the ways of fate that are veiled even from a diviner's eyes, and many more are clear to us that were better veiled from all. Much I know that is better unforetold, and some things that I may not foretell on pain of centuries of punishment. But this I know and foretell that you will never come to Carcassonne. Instantly there was a buzz of talk telling of Carcassonne. Some had heard of it in speech or song, some had read of it, and some had dreamed of it. And the king sent Arlian of the harp down from his right hand to mingle with the wheeled folk, to hear aught that any told of Carcassonne. But the warriors told of the places they had won to, many a hard-held fortress, many a far-off land, and swore that they would come to Carcassonne. And in a while came Arlian back to the king's right hand, and raised his harp and chanted and told of Carcassonne. Far away it was, and far and far away, a city of gleaming ramparts rising one over other, and marble terraces behind the ramparts, and fountains shimmering on the terraces. To Carcassonne the elf kings with their fairies had first retreated from men, and had built it on an evening late in May by blowing their elfin horns. Carcassonne! Carcassonne! Travelers had seen it sometimes like a clear dream, with the sun glittering in its citadel upon a far-off hilltop, and then the clouds had come or a sudden mist. No one had seen it long or come quite close to it though once there were some men that came very near, and the smoke from the houses blew into their faces, a sudden gust, no more, and these declared that someone was burning cedar wood there. Men had dreamed that there was a witch there, walking alone through the cold courts and corridors of Marmorian palaces, fearfully beautiful and still for all her fourscore centuries, singing the second oldest song, which was taught to her by the sea shedding tears for loneliness from eyes that would madden armies, yet will she not call her dragons home. Carcassonne is terribly guarded. Sometimes she swims in a marble bath through whose deeps a river tumbles, or lies all morning on the edge of it to dry slowly in the sun, and watches the heaving river trouble the deeps of the bath. It flows through the caverns of earth for further than she knows, and coming to light in the witch's bath goes down through the earth again to its own peculiar sea. In autumn sometimes it comes down black with snow that spring has molten in unimagined mountains, or withered blooms of mountain shrubs go beautifully by. When there is blood in the bath, she knows there is war in the mountains, and yet she knows not where those mountains are. When she sings, the fountains dance up from the dark earth. When she combs her hair, they say there are storms at sea. When she is angry, the wolves go brave and all come down from the byres. When she is sad, the sea is sad, and both are sad forever. Carcassonne, Carcassonne, the city is the fairest of the wonders of morning. The sun shouts when he beholdeth it, for Carcassonne evening weepeth when evening passeth away. 
and Arlean told how many goodly perils were round about the city, and how the way was unknown, and it was a nightly venture. Then all the warriors stood up and sang of the splendor of the venture, and Camarak swore by the gods that had builded Arn, and by the honor of his warriors, that, alive or dead, he would come to Carcassonne. But the diviner rose and passed out of the hall, brushing the crumbs from him with his hands and smoothing his robe as he went. Then Camarac said, There are many things to be planned, and counsels to be taken, and provender to be gathered. Upon what day shall we start? And all the warriors answering shouted, Now! And Camarac smiled thereat, for he had but tried them. Down then from the walls they took their weapons, Sycorix, Celeron, Asloth, Wool of the Axe, Huhinoth, Peacebreaker, Woolwolf, Father of War, Tarion, Lurth of the War Cry, and many another. Little then dreamed the spiders that sat in that ringing hall of the unmolested leisure they were soon to enjoy. When they were armed, they all formed up and marched out of the hall, and Arlian strode before them, singing of Carcassonne. But the talk of the weald arose and went back well-fed to buyers. They had no need of wars or rare perils. They were ever at war with hunger. A long drought or hard winter were to them pitched battles. If the wolves entered a sheepfold, it was like the loss of a fortress. A thunderstorm on the harvest was like an ambuscade. Well fed, they went back slowly to their byres, being at truce with hunger, and the night filled with stars. And black against the starry sky appeared the round helms of the warriors as they passed the tops of the ridges, but in the valleys they sparkled now and then as starlight flashed on steel. They followed behind Arlian going south, whence rumors had always come of Carcassonne, so they marched in the starlight, and he before them singing. When they had marched so far that they heard no sound from Arn, and even inaudible were her swinging bells, when candles burning late far up in towers no longer sent them their disconsolate welcome, in the midst of the pleasant night that lulls the rural spaces, weariness came upon Arleon, and his inspiration failed. It failed slowly. Gradually he grew less sure of the way to Carcassonne. A while he stopped to think and remembered the way again, but his clear certainty was gone, and in its place were efforts in his mind to recall old prophecies and shepherd songs that told of the marvelous city. Then, as he said over carefully to himself a song that a wanderer had learned from a goatherd's boy far up in the lower slope of ultimate southern mountains, fatigue came down upon his toiling mind like snow on the winding ways of a city noisy by night, stilling all. He stood and the warriors closed up to him. For long they had passed by great oaks standing solitary here and there, like giants taking huge breaths of the night air before doing some furious deed. Now they had come to the verge of a black forest. The tree trunks stood like those great columns in an Egyptian hall, whence God, in an older mood, received the praise of men. The top of it sloped the way of an ancient wind. Here they all halted and lighted a fire of branches, striking sparks from flint into a heap of bracken. They eased them of their armor and sat round the fire, and Camarac stood up there and addressed them, and Camarac said, We go to war with fate, who has doomed that I shall not come to Carcassonne. And if we turn aside but one of the dooms of fate, then the whole future of the world is ours, and the future that fate has ordered is like the dry course of an averted river. But if such men as we, such resolute conquerors, cannot prevent one doom that fate has planned, then is the race of man enslaved forever to do its petty and allotted task. Then they all drew their swords and waved them high in the firelight and declared war on fate. Nothing in the somber forest stirred or made any sound. Tired men do not dream of war. When morning came over the gleaming fields, a company that had set out from Arn discovered the camping place of the warriors and brought pavilions and provender. And the warriors feasted, and the birds in the forest sang, and the inspiration of Arleon awoke. 
Then they rose and, following Arleon, entered the forest and marched away to the south. And many a woman of Arne sent her thoughts with them as they played alone some old monotonous tune, but their own thoughts were far before them, skimming over the bath through whose deeps the river tumbles in marble carcassonne. When butterflies were dancing on the air, and the sun neared the zenith, pavilions were pitched, and all the warriors rested, and then they feasted again, and then they played nightly games, and, late in the afternoon, marched on once more, singing of Carcassonne. And night came down with its mystery on the forest, and gave their demoniac look again to the trees, and rolled up out of misty hollows a huge and yellow moon. And the men of Arn lit fires, and sudden shadows arose and leapt fantastically away. And the night wind blew, arising like a ghost, and passed between the tree trunks, and slipped down shimmering glades, and waked the prowling beasts still dreaming of day, and drifted nocturnal birds afield to menace timorous things, and beat the roses of the befriending night, and wafted to the ears of wandering men the sound of a maiden's song, and gave a glamour to the lutenist's tune played in his loneliness on distant hills, and the deep eyes of moths glowed like a galleon's lamps as they spread their wings and sailed their familiar sea. Upon this night wind also the dreams of Camarac's men floated to Carcassonne. All the next morning they marched, and all the evening, and knew they were nearing now the deeps of the forest. And the citizens of Arn kept close together and close behind the warriors, for the deeps of the forest were all unknown to travelers, but not unknown to those tales of fear that men tell at evenings to their friends in the comfort and safety of their hearths. Then night appeared, and an enormous moon, and the men of Camarac slept. Sometimes they woke and went to sleep again, and those that stayed awake for long and listened heard heavy two-footed creatures pad through the night on paws. As soon as it was light, the unarmed men of Arn began to slip away and went back by bands through the forest. When darkness came, they did not stop to sleep, but continued their flight straight on until they came to Arn and added there by the tales they told to the terror of the forest. But the warriors feasted, and afterwards Arleon rose and played his harp and led them on again, and a few faithful servants stayed with them still. And they marched all day through a gloom that was as old as night, but Arleon's inspiration burned in his mind like a star, and he led them till the birds began to drop into the treetops, and it was evening, and they all encamped. They had only one pavilion left to them now, and near it they lit a fire, and Camarac posted a sentry with drawn sword just beyond the glow of the firelight. Some of the warriors slept in the pavilion, and others round about it. When dawn came, something terrible had killed and eaten the sentry. But the splendor of the rumors of Carcassonne, and fate's decree that they should never come there, and the inspiration of Arleon and his harp all urged the warriors on, and they marched deeper and deeper all day into the forest. Once they saw a dragon that had caught a bear and was playing with it, letting it run a little way and overtaking it with a paw. They came at last to a clear space in the forest just before nightfall. An odor of flowers arose from it like a mist, and every drop of dew interpreted heaven unto itself. It was the hour when twilight kisses earth. It was the hour when a meaning comes into senseless things, and trees out majesty the pomp of monarchs, and the timid creatures steal abroad to feed, and as yet the beasts of prey harmlessly dream, and earth utters a sigh, and it is night. In the midst of the wide clearing, Camarac's warriors camped and rejoiced to see stars again appearing one by one. That night they ate the last of their provisions and slept unmolested by the prowling things that haunt the gloom of the forest. On the next day, some of the warriors hunted stags and others lay in rushes by a neighboring lake and shot arrows at waterfowl. One stag was killed and some geese and several teal. Here the adventurers stayed, breathing the pure wild air that cities know not. By day they hunted and lit fires by night, and sang and feasted and forgot Carcassonne. The terrible denizens of the gloom never molested them. Venison was plentiful, and all manner of waterfowl. 
They love the chase by day, and by night their favorite songs. Thus day after day went by, thus week after week. Time flung over this encampment a handful of moons, the gold and silver moons that wasted the air away. Autumn and winter passed, and spring appeared, and still the warriors hunted and feasted there. One night of the springtide they were feasting about a fire and telling tales of the chase, and the soft moths came out of the dark and flaunted their colors in the firelight and went out gray into the dark again. And the night wind was cool upon the warriors' necks, and the campfire was warm on their faces, and a silence had settled among them after some song, and Arleon all at once rose suddenly up, remembering Carcassonne. And his hand swept over the strings of his harp, awakening the deeper chords, like the sound of a nimble people dancing their steps on bronze, and the music rolled away into the night's own silence, and the voice of Arleon rose. When there is blood in the bath she knows, there is war in the mountains, and longs for the battle shout of kingly men. And suddenly all shouted, Carcassonne! And at that word their idleness was gone as a dream is gone from a dreamer waked with a shout. And soon the great march began that faltered no more nor wavered. Unchecked by battles, undaunted in lonesome spaces, ever unwearied by the vulturous ears, the warriors of Camarok held on, and Arleon's inspiration led them still. They cleft with the music of Arleon's harp the gloom of ancient silences. They went singing into battles with terrible wild men and came out singing, but with fewer voices. They came to villages and valleys full of music of bells or saw the lights at dusk of cottages sheltering others. They became a proverb for wandering and a legend arose of strange disconsolate men. Folk spoke of them at nightfall when the fire was warm and rain slipped down the eaves, and when the wind was high, small children feared the men who would not rest were going clattering past. Strange tales were told of men in old gray armor moving at twilight along the tops of the hills and never asking shelter, and mothers told their boys who grew impatient of home that the gray wanderers were once so impatient and were now hopeless of rest and were driven along with the rain whenever the wind was angry. But the wanderers were cheered in their wandering by the hope of coming to Carcassonne, and later on by anger against fate, and at last they marched on still because it seemed better to march on than to think. For many years they had wandered and had fought with many tribes. Often they gathered legends in villages and listened to idle singers singing songs, and all the rumors of Carcassonne still came from the south. And then one day they came to a hilly land with a legend in it that only three valleys away a man might see on clear days, Carcassonne. Tired though they were and few and worn with the years which had all brought them wars, they pushed on instantly, led still by Arleon's inspiration, which dwindled in his age, though he made music with his old harp still. All day they climbed down into the first valley and for two days ascended and came to the town that may not be taken in war below the top of the mountain and its gates were shut against them and there was no way round. To the left and right steep precipices stood for as far as eye could see or legend tell of and the pass lay through the city. Therefore Camarac drew up his remaining warriors in line of battle to wage their last war, and they stepped forward over the crisp bones of old, unburied armies. No sentinel defied them in the gate. No arrow flew from any tower of war. One citizen climbed alone to the mountain's top, and the rest hid themselves in sheltered places. Now, In the top of the mountain was a deep, bowl-like cavern in the rock in which fires bubbled softly. But if any cast a boulder into the fires, as it was the custom for one of those citizens to do when enemies approached them, the mountain hurled up intermittent rocks for three days, and the rocks fell flaming all over the town and all round about it. And just as Camarack's men began to batter the gate, they heard a crash on the mountain, and a great rock fell beyond them and rolled into the valley. The next two fell in front of them on the iron roofs of the town, and just as they entered the town, a rock found them crowded in a narrow street and shattered two of them. The mountain smoked and panted. With every pant, a rock plunged into the streets or bounced along the heavy iron roof, and the smoke went slowly up 
and up and up. When they had come through the long town's empty streets to the locked gate at the end, only fifteen were left. When they had broken down the gate, there were only ten alive. Three more were killed as they went up the slope, and two as they passed near the terrible cavern. Fate let the rest go some way down the mountain upon the other side, and then took three of them. Camarac and Arleon alone were left alive. And night came down in the valley in which they had come, and was lit by flashes from the fatal mountain, and the two mourned for their comrades all night long. But when the morning came, they remembered their war with fate and their old resolve to come to Carcassonne, and the voice of Arleon rose in a quavering song and snatches of music from his old harp, and he stood up and marched with his face southwards as he had done for years, and behind him Camarac went. And when at last they climbed from the third valley and stood on the hill summit in the golden sunlight of evening, their aged eyes saw only miles of forest and the birds going to roost. Their beards were white, and they had traveled very far and hard. It was the time with them when a man rests from labors and dreams in light sleep of the years that were and not of the years to come. Long they looked southwards, and the sun set over remoter forests, and glowworms lit their lamps, and the inspiration of Arleon rose and flew away forever to gladden, perhaps, the dreams of younger men. And Arleon said, My king, I know no longer the way to Carcassonne. And Camarac smiled as the aged smile, with little cause for mirth, and said, The years are going by us like huge birds, whom doom and destiny and the schemes of God have frightened up out of some old grey marsh. And it may well be that against these no warrior may avail, and that fate has conquered us, and that our quest has failed. And after this they were silent. Then they drew their swords, and side by side went down into the forest, still seeking Carcassonne. I think they got not far, for there were deadly marshes in that forest, and gloom that outlasted the nights, and fearful beasts accustomed to its ways. Neither is there any legend, either in verse or among the songs of the people of the fields, of any having come to Carcassonne. My favorite sentence in this story is, Little then dreamed the spiders that sat in that ringing hall of the unmolested leisure they were soon to enjoy. There are so many good ones that I don't want to call a single sentence the best. This story, like all of Dunsany's work, is so evocative and full of these incredibly powerful moments. I love the description in the beginning of the hall, where the weapons are hung within arm's reach and no trophies of their accomplishments are placed any higher because they still dream of doing more, and the clouds spilling in over the stone wall and evening darkening the blue ceiling. And I love the sequence where they kind of stall along the way like the lotus eaters until Arleon recovers himself and strikes the harp. And the image that some say they're wandering still like a ghost ship or a phantom. And finally, of course, Camarac and Arleon going on together into certain doom, defying fate even though they don't know the way. It's like that amazing scene at the end of The Wild Bunch. Now, Let's go back to the small phrase at the very beginning. It may surprise you to know that Lord Dunsany did not have access to Google and was not able to look up the origin of the quote that was written to him in the letter. But I, ladies and gentlemen, am able to look up that quote. It's a reference to a French folk song written by Gustave Nadaud. It's a short song, so here's an English translation by John Reuben Thompson. I'm growing old. I've 60 years. I've labored all my life in vain, and all that time of hopes and fears I've failed my dearest wish to gain. I see full well that here below bliss unalloyed there is for none. My prayer will ne'er fulfillment know. I never have seen Carcassonne. I never have seen Carcassonne. 
You see the city from the hill, it lies beyond the mountains blue, and yet to reach it one must still five long and weary leagues pursue, and to return as many more. Ah, oh, had the vintage plenteous grown, the grape withheld its yellow store, I shall not look on Carcassonne, I shall not look on Carcassonne. They tell me every day is there, not more or less than Sunday gay. In shining robes and garments fair, the people walk upon their way. One gazes there on castle walls as grand as those of Babylon. A bishop and two generals. I do not know fair Carcassonne. I do not know fair Carcassonne. The vicar's right. He says that we are ever wayward, weak and blind. He tells us in his homily, ambition ruins all mankind. Yet could I there two days have spent while still the autumn sweetly shone? Ah, me, I might have died content when I had looked on Carcassonne, when I had looked on Carcassonne. Thy pardon, Father, I beseech, in this my prayer if I append, one something sees beyond his reach from childhood to his journey's end. My wife, our little boy Agnon, have travelled even to Narbonne, my grandchild has seen Perpignan, and I have not seen Carcassonne, and I have not seen Carcassonne. So crooned one day, close by Le Mou, a peasant double-bent with age. Rise up, my friend, said I, with you I'll go upon this pilgrimage. We left next morning his abode, but, heaven forbid him, halfway on, the old man died upon the road. He never gazed on Carcassonne. Each mortal has his carcassonne. It is crazy to me that despite not knowing this song at all, Dunsany's story evokes so much of the same tone and themes. The, the sense of the beautiful and the ideal forever out of reach as time moves on. The peasant in the song strives with time and fate as much as Camerac does. The peasant is 60 years old, so he's been wrestling with time for six bouts. And this core idea that if you could fight fate and win just once, your future would become your own. Those parallels are so interesting. By the way, although the original lyrics and score for the song are in the public domain, I wasn't able to find any public domain recordings. If you really want to listen to a rendition of it, I will put a link in the description below. If you listen all the way to the end of the video, you get to hear me make a little confession. And of course, this week's confession is that I have been to Carcassonne, and I was just recently thinking about it when I stumbled across this story. So of course, to me, it seemed like fate. Carcassonne is gorgeous, both the citadel over the city and the lower town and the river and the Canal du Midi. It's like a fairy tale kind of place. Interestingly, Carcassonne gets about as many annual visitors as Mont Saint-Michel, but it seems far less famous among Americans, and it is far less crowded when you are there. Perhaps because the fortress at Carcassonne is larger, and visitors aren't constrained by the tides to those narrow time frames. But every corner you turn in Carcassonne seems like somewhere you could kind of get lost and hide away. To be honest, as an American, even after 10 years, it still seems shocking to me that Europe is just littered with these incredible ancient fortresses and castles and cathedrals and monuments, and I live a couple hundred meters from some Roman baths, and everyone just goes around all the time like that's normal, and I still go around all the time staring at everything like a tourist. But this story and the song truly make Carcassonne seem like a proper Shangri-La fairy tale type of place. Does it still have that allure to modern Europeans? Or is everyone so jaded that no place still has a magic in it? Or has the magic moved somewhere else? What's the most magical European city in 2024? Is it Vienna? Is it Prague? If you are interested in magical stories and weird places, or magical places and weird stories, subscribe to the channel. Choose notifications so you never miss a story, and please also like this video, share it with somebody who would like it, and drop me a comment below. I am so grateful for all your help and support in growing the channel, and I will see you next week.